Okay, we're live. Hello, everyone. This is Shudeep Sen from Delhi. And Fiona Sampson from Britain. And this is the first episode, season one, and we have three fabulous, fabulous writer and a translator, Brian Holton. And um, yes, we start with uh, Magda Carnecci. Magda, hello, how are you? Where are you right now? You need to unmute. Hello, everybody, and nice to see you. I'm in Bucharest now where there is snow and everything is white. Fantastic, fantastic. And um, Leanne, where are you? China, Berlin, London? It's difficult to keep track of you. I'm uh, again in the green. I think the color we share internationally, not easy to have a white or the sunshine, but gray and the gray and the gray universe. But I'm at a part of gray in Berlin. Welcome. Fabulous, welcome. And Martin. And Brian. Yes, and Martin with one R in your surname. Where are you speaking to us from? Uh, I couldn't unmute myself. I'm speaking to you from uh, Copenhagen uh, right now in Denmark. Welcome. It's great to hear all three of you. And Brian, please tell us where you are. Uh, Brian Holton. In, uh, Melrose in the south of Scotland, just south of Edinburgh and the beautiful border hills, just within sight of the River Tweed. And it's not snowing. Fantastic. Well, I think it's going to be an extraordinary, it's afternoon here, so I'm going to say afternoon, it's going to be an extraordinary afternoon. Three wonderful sets of poetry, three wonderful readings. Each poet will read for a good, long, generous set for 12 minutes or so. And our discussion about poetry and philosophy will follow um, their readings. And the reading order is going to be Magda Kernet. Uh, Yang Lian with Brian Holton, who's reading his English translations of Lian, and Martin Glasserup. So I think we're in for a wonderful and very thought-provoking afternoon, because one of the reasons that we invited these three poets to read together is that all three of them are poets and philosopher poets at the same time. You see, it means something different in each body of work. And it'll be fascinating, I think, to see them and hear them side by side and compare how philosophy works in different ways through their poems. So I think that Shadeep is going to in introduce Magda now. So I'll formally introduce Magda. Uh, I've put the long bio on the chat box. Please feel free to use the chat, chat box uh, generously. Put your links, put books, book covers, events that are coming up and so on. It's because all the record is there and everything is recorded and it's finally uploaded to our YouTube channels as well. So there's an archive of everything that's happening here. Magna Carnecci is a Romanian poet, art essayist and prose writer. After the revolution of December, 1989, she became actively involved in the political and cultural Romanian scene. She got her PhD in art history in Paris in 1997. She has published many books of literature, cultural essays, and art history. Some of her volumes of poetry in Romanian have been translated into English, French, Spanish, and Dutch. Her novel, FEM, Femme, has been translated into French in 2019 and will appear in the US in 2021. Her poems have been translated into numerous languages and have appeared in many anthologies and in many international reviews. She was the president of FEN Romania and is a member of the European Cultural Parliament. Magda, the floor is yours. Thank you for inviting me to this uh, poetic conclave, which is so uh, uh, interesting for me and provoking at the same time. I'm really honored to be a part of this event, which will uh, uh, last the whole year, if I understood well. For, for this session, I uh, chose to read three long poems 
from a, a series uh, entitled uh, Spiritual Poems. Uh, sometimes I call them a sort of psalms, but maybe it's better to say to, to to stay with spiritual poems. An un an annunciation. Just as with delicate minuscule signs, the flutter of a fish's fin, the twitch of a butterfly's antenna. A fetus announces its presence gently as in an ambiguous hint, a phantasm in the womb of a lonely and patient woman. So you too, slowly, with faint, humble signals and intimations, a choral murmur among the lips, a lightning flash in sleep, red finger traces on the sky's belly have allowed me to feel you closer and closer, more overwhelming yet unimaginably gently, as if I were not the baby still taking form in your cosmic placenta, a blind worm in metamorphosis, in transfiguration, in the depth of the universal uterus, but you, through a mysterious reversal, were inside me, in this world, a germ, long patient waiting to bud and sending its signs, vast and anonymous, through the amniotic liquid that surrounds us all, through the terrestrial aquarium in which I flowed blindly. In the museum of clocks and watches, like a pregnant caretaker too scattered brained to give birth, I get lost among histories and epochs, among theories and systems, repair the mechanisms, sometimes glancing absent-mindedly on the window, I see carmine clouds in optic glory, light terrestrial aquarium, there's something to reveal something to remind me of you, as if not I, but you in this world were a fragile, incomplete germ scattered among the leaves in the sunset and aurora borealis, an unconceived sun, cosmic fruit of my being, delicately touching me both within and without, I in you, you in me, I an infant in you, you, an infant in me, to whom I, miss, I must give birth, not on the outside, but inside, and thus set free. Feminine Feminist Cry. Why is the road that comes to you so hard, so terrible? Why so many avalanches, deserts, bitter traps, the labyrinth with no way out, the infinite distance? Why? You want us nevertheless. You desire us. You need me. Then why so much pain on the narrow path that starts in the bones, descends to the heart, rises to the brain, ends in darkness? Maybe we are a mistake, an unforeseen excess of your plenitude. 
maybe we shouldn't have upsprung into the cosmic self, into the entrails of the worlds. Or the form of our substance was supposed to be different at this dark edge in this dump of celestial thought. Who tossed us in the trash, packaged us in a body, subjected us to gravitation, to multiplication? Who scattered you everywhere in so many drops, universes, particles, out of which you no longer know how to compose yourself again, to gather yourself? Maybe we are a miscalculation of divine harmony that eras, continents, dead cultures bewail in despair, that civilizations of diligent thinking cells hide under metropolises, transform into luxury. Maybe all is the trickle of spirit into matter which nobody and nothing can return to the source. Or maybe our role is different, much humbler, more wretched, to cleanse the alveoli of the worlds, to filter light of what's negative, to turn excrement into gold, somehow to sublimate suffering from our body to mold a small alembic for impure but cosmic fantasies, from our tears to the still burning water for the heavy metals, for the black suit of the stars, from our torment to set free a mode of song, of vibration that might reach you, please you with its incense then to climb again the difficult stairs of Genesis, to go beyond planets, suns, to pass beyond galaxies once more, beyond every world, to enter back into the matrix, into thought, to fuse into you. You have enclosed me in a woman's body and you want me to be a goddess but I cannot advance towards you except by crawling through mud, sweat, blood, through men and children, on my knees, spread wide open, crucified, like a slave, a whore, a mother of all, eternally defeated, eternally grieving, equal to the dust, the thoroughfare, the highway, maiden, matron, witch, vestal, join in, a, in one poor being, violated and adored, killed yet worshipped. Always having for be born, start over again, so that later to climb through me, blood-stained yet pure, the spark that satisfies you, nurtures you. Because you cannot otherwise recompose yourself grain by grain out of matter. You cannot otherwise free yourself from life and death, from metamorphosis and imagination. You cannot save yourself except through me. With me, can you be one? And the last poem is entitled Inner Man. Man inside me. I see you coming from the depths, from frozen, empty darkness, slowly advancing toward me in your tunic of light. You keep advancing, advancing toward me, 
yet you get no closer. The distance between us seems to remain the same. You want and want, you want so much to get closer to me, but something unseen, an icy blizzard, a magnetic force prevents you. Inward man, I see you climbing, so pale from very far away. You are a small phosphorescent pearl in the thick darkness. You want to grow, to come near, to enter, but my distance, cold, weary, unexpectedly thwarts you. Like an iceberg of darkness, an invisible barricade. You walk on and on. Your steps float silently above the earth. Your tunic of light flutters without sound. In a man, I see you slowly raise your arm and hurl from the desk a glowing dot, a fire seed that chops on my bosom. The magnetic force shudders, the cold distance echoes with groans, an immense terror vibrates in the air. My body ages as if dying, the axis of my being has become painful, where the spark of light fell, savage fear and joy, great pain and uncomprehensible hope. Both there and here, in the depths, something takes place. Something dies in me. Something is born. A grinding blackness, a nebula of enormous desires, a terrible contraction, out of which, frail, pale, something sees its own image. Far away, small, in a tunic of light, deep inside me, divine man, you gush forth like buoyant water. Vertiginously you grow, like a tree that towers as high as the stars. Gradually you fill me with a strange, nurturing light. I I am iridescent, I am vast, I contain suns and planets, the spiraling arms of galaxies, universes in diaphanous cascades. You are reborn deep inside me. In loving ways you flow forth from me. In a man, you are all the worlds. In a man. You are me. Thank you. Oh, that was beautiful. That was beautiful. Wonderful. Following that line of thought was extraordinary each time, uh, Magda. You sort of your poems are very. Um, you, you everything is in motion. You know, you're drawing us. There's no the world is in flux and. We're, relationship and that's narrative which kind of comes around full circle again I mean it's extraordinary work uh, Magda a lot of people on chat are asking if they could hear you read something in Romanian and I wonder whether you could bear to read us maybe the beginning of one of those poems now that we we got the meaning to hear the music as it were it would be wonderful we haven't quite worked out I think the technicals yet of having um, simultaneous translation on the screen so that poets can read in their original, which is obviously the ideal and what one works towards. What would you feel about that, Magda? Before we go I can on, try to find that. one of these uh, three poems in Romanian and uh, love it to you from my computer if it's well, if, if it's well, fine yeah, but for, I mean, for you. We just love to hear you read in Romanian, I think. Is it what you mean or voice. you want to? Yeah. Yeah, huh? that's 
Hmm. As simple I, as that. I can also send you my my poems, um, but I don't know if I I'm very capable of doing this. Uh, no, don't to send them. Just to read out loud now. I will read the beginning the beginning of the first poem, which is an annunciation. Thank you. That's wonderful. O annunciare. Așa cum, cu delicate, minuscule semne, o fulfuire de aripioară de pește, zvâcnetul unor filamente de fluture, un făt își face anunțată prezența blând ca o părere nesigură, o nălucă în pântecele unei femei singuratice, în așteptare, tot așa tu, încet, cu delicate, umile semnale și urme, un murmur coral în frunzișuri, o fugerare luminoasă în somn, dâre roșii de degete pe pântecul cerului, mai lăsat să te simt din ce în ce mai aproape, mai copleșitor și totuși cu o neînchipuită blândețe. Ca și cum nu eu aș fi prunc încă în facere, în placenta ta cosmică, un vierme orb în metamorfoză, în transfigurare, în adâncul uterului universal, ci tu, prin misterioasă răsturnare, ai fi în mine, în lumea asta, un germen care așteaptă îndelung răbdător să încolțească. Și trimite semnale anonime și vaste în lichidul amniotic din jur, în acvariul terestru în care eu putesc oarbă. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you. So fascinating to hear the way the, the music, the voice encases the ideas in the original. We definitely have to get the sort of that we have the translations and then poets can read in the original. It's so important to hear your own voice. What, what do you feel when you're reading in English in your translation? What do you, what does that it feel depends. like? Uh, sometimes it's uh, easier, sometimes it's uh, more difficult. I don't know why. When my poems are um, abstract and they have many neologisms, it seems to me more difficult <laughs> to pronounce the neologisms in English. But when I uh, I read poems like these ones, which are which have a vocabulary not so uh, uh, contemporary or uh, mm -hmm. I don't know technological, it's easier, and I feel more like when I pronounce the words, I need to feel them, and even in English. But it's not always the case. In English, it's. Uh, a wonderful language, but a difficult one because it's it has so many words. It's so rich in vocabulary that you never you never know if you understand all the meanings of, of the words in English and if your pronunciation is correct. I have to to check on on internet and on dictionary the pronunciation of many more words, even if I speak uh, a little bit of English. That's very interesting because oh, should I? Yeah. Magda, sorry. sorry. Uh, yeah, so Magda, when I first, my first encounter with your poetry was through my year. This was way back in the Athens when you read your poetry in Romanian. So in a way, um, I actually was introduced to your poetry the way your poems ought to sound. And then of course we exchanged books and so on. And I remember Cosmos was the book I think you gave me. And I was completely startled when I saw the, uh, the, the, the English constructions and the English layout on the page because I never find the same poem to be in a kind of sharp staccato format. And that is something that is evident when you read. When you're reading in Romanian, it's much more compact. There's a sort of sense of lyricism, which is uh, calibrated. When you read the English, it's almost like you're tearing the language apart and putting it back in. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I don't know. It depends on tr translations. I work with the same uh, translator for a long time. Uh, his name is Adam J. Uh, Sorkin. 
And I have also a Romanian uh, madam who helps me, but nevertheless, uh, um, it's a huge difference between a Latin language like Romanian and the Germanic language like English. And that sometimes I feel really uh, frustrated about you know, the friction, this is the, the sonorous friction of words, which is different in English than in Romanian. Romanian is a more musical language, so to say, while English is very uh, offensive, uh, <laughs> uh, a, a, a language of warriors, <laughs> so to say. <laughs> Um, well, and also so, English is a language with more than one root, isn't it? I mean, it's a Germanic language, but it also has a Latin, a whole Latin vocabulary and register. And so it's much more mixed and therefore it doesn't resonate with itself, inside itself, the way a language which has a single root does. That's true. Romanian also has two roots, uh, the Latin one and the Slavic one. Right. And the English has mm -hmm. the Normandic and the Germanic uh, roots. But I, I, um, I have to say that I feel a difference between the American English and the British English. The American Eng English seems to me more open to words coming from uh, the Latin sphere from from the so i don't know if it's true but i, I have i have this feeling that I, while uh, the british english uh, keeps closer to the um, to the germanic words i think that's very interesting and i certainly think it's true in literary terms i mean i think there's quite a strong belief in britain that literary writing is strengthened by using Germanic roots because our French synonyms are often more abstract and we are culturally very interested in the concrete and the empirical. And so, and particularly in poetry at the moment, which in North America is really quite intellectual and un, it's not very chthonic. And in Britain, we're still holding on to that kind of materiality. I mean, this is to generalize hugely, but yeah. I would say that in the poetic kind of wars between our two across the Atlantic, that's definitely something that's going on. And of course that does mean that translating from a romance language into British English, you end up with, I would say something very subtle and beautiful, but more mixed, much more of a melange. Can I, can I ask Magda, I mean, clearly listening to Romanian, which I don't speak, it rhymes more easily than English does. Now, oh, yeah. <laughs> English is not easy to rhyme in, but um, do you impose a rhyme scheme on your poetry in Romanian? Or does oh, it just, no. no? No, 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 not at all. Um, but sometimes it happens. I don't know why. Maybe the rhythm uh, demands a rhyme at the end of, uh, of the line or so, but otherwise, no. Uh, French, in French, it is even more e easier to, uh, even easier to have uh, rhymes at the end of, the, of every line because it's a more regulated language than Romanian. In, in, in French, it's difficult not to rhyme. Exactly, exactly. It's like Robert Louis Stevenson said that for English speakers, um, when we're writing prose, it's very difficult not to write prose in iambic tetrameter. <laughs> yes, yes, so that's it. Yeah. Uh -huh. So it's Amanda, very talking about talking about sound because you at the end will be the final judge for say passing which English translation will hold for you because ultimately it's your poetry that's being represented, and in this case I mean British versus uh, American. So when you have to take a call, which one do you veer towards? Because when I read your poetry in English, I'm not so much thinking about whether it's American or English. I'm actually reading the English text on the page. It's only when I later on see who has translated it and read their bio that that aspect comes in. But in, in, in terms of sound, because the sound aspect of your poetry is so important, which one do you prefer? It's difficult to, to say. Uh, I, I'm not so, uh, I, don't, I, I don't know exactly. It depends on how it sounds in, uh, in the poem, uh, within the poem, so to say. 
um, that sometimes I, I noticed that my American translator that he prefers some special words, which in my ears sound a little bit uh, pretentious. And they are normally they are of, of Latin or uh, Romance uh, origin. For example, I give you an, a small example. He translated the the more the the a small river in Romania, small very small river with a rivulet. And when I saw this rivulet, I I had never met this word before. It, of course, it's very uh, clear to me what it means rivulet. But uh, to put it into a poem, into a modern poem, sounded to me a little bit uh, extravagant. But uh, Adam, my translator, uh, convinced me that no, it's a word that exists in the academic English in the state. So I had to accept it. This is fascinating. I think we are probably going to come back to talk about translation well every month. But I, I mean, I, I, I suspect later on this afternoon too. I'm slightly conscious that we probably should move on to Leanne, but uh, please don't go away Magda because it will be wonderful to talk to you again at, at the end of the readings. By the way, I couldn't agree more about rivulet. Here we wouldn't use it for little river, we'd use it for um, a small amount of something liquid. <laughs> so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, um, mm. Next reading are going to be uh, Yang Lian and Brian Holton and Shadeep, are you going to introduce? I'll, I'll introduce Yang, uh, Lian, and you can introduce Brian, so we can do it that way. So Lian, welcome, welcome again. And uh, we're talking about sound and music. We're going to hear a lot of that. And I, I'm really, really interested in the sort of uh, Chinese Scottish crossover, uh, which is far away from English at one, at one level. <laughs> So formally, uh, Yan Liang is a Chinese poet born in Switzerland who grew up in China and now lives in London and Berlin. He published 15 volumes of poetry, two volumes of prose and many essays. His work has been translated into more than 30 languages and it is representative works include I, Y, I, where the sea stands still, Concentric Circles, Riding Pisces, Poems from Five Collections, Lee Valley Poem, Narrative Poem, Anniversary Snow, and others. His work have been praised as, and this is interesting because this I want to bring into the discussion. So a critic says, his poetry is like McDermott meets Rilke with samurai sword drawn. <laughs> Quite something. Uh, he's won just so many prizes that I had to finally delete the whole lot of them to read it out. But some of them include the 2020 Zhu Prize in China, the 2019 Premier Sulmona in Italy, uh, the North Sud International Prize for Literature in 2018, also in Italy, uh, the International Grand Poetry Prize, the Janus Panius Prize in Hungary, um, narrative poem in 19, the book not narrative poem in 19, uh, in 2017 was the Poetry Book Society recommendation in the UK, as well as it won the Penn uh, Award in 2016. He was a Dard Fellow in Berlin in 1991 to 1992. In 2013, he was invited to become the member of the Norwegian Academy for Literature and freedom of expression. And since 2014, he's been a distinguished professor and writer in residence at the Shantou University in China. Lian, the emperor beckons. <laughs> Welcome Lian, and I'm going to introduce Brian Holton, who I'm going to read your bio first, Brian. Brian Holton translates poetry and prose from modern classical Chinese into English and Scots. He's published almost 20 books of Lian's work, most recently Anniversary Snow, Venice Elegy and Narrative Poem. His collection of classical poems in Scots, Stona Malane, sorry about my pronunciation, um, was published by Shearsman in 2016. He makes regular appearances at conferences and literary festivals and has lectured at universities in the UK, Europe, the US, New Zealand, China and elsewhere. 
He's won prizes for his translations and for his own original poetry. He sings and plays the music of the Scottish borders where he was born and where he now lives, as we know, in Melrose. He was recording his first solo album until lockdown closed the studios. Gosh, you really have my sympathies for that. This is going to be an absolute joy for me because I've read many times and worked many times with Leanne before. Leanne is very generous to other poets and has set up many projects where we collaborate. We we reciprocally co-translate, but of course this is not like the kind of masterful translation of Brian, um, Brian Holton, so it'll be absolutely wonderful to hear this, um, this bilingual performance. Welcome both and thank you very much for joining us. Can hear me and uh, um, yeah. Um, well, this is very exciting to uh, join you online, which is uh, uh, seems when the world been simply cut off, uh, but we can communicate, you know, we always find the creative way to push the poetry uh, move on. And therefore, I think Brian Holton and me, uh, we select this uh, uh, actually small uh, sequence or a small group of poems. Uh, which title the I devised study. Uh, it's from my this book, Anniversary Snow, again published by Shishman. So um, Magda and us are the from the same family, yeah, uh, of the of the publisher. Um, well, this word I devised the study. Uh, came from the English translation of uh, a center in Berlin called the Wissenschaft Kolik. Uh, it's a well-known uh, center for the uh, scholars and uh, very few writers, but to study the, well, the subject you feel worse for the future of the world. And, uh, and so that's uh, I advanced, uh, I advanced uh, it's interesting uh, for me and uh, because uh, what's mean of that advanced, you know, and uh, uh, well, in the poem, this concept of time is actually included in the poem. And uh, um, so hopefully uh, you can hear that. And again, in our case, you will hear not only one original, but the two originals, the Chinese and the Scottish style, the whiskey style. Uh, no, only, only one of them is true. <laughs> or maybe beer, sorry. Uh, well, anyway, uh, I think uh, this poem I dedicate, dedicated to Adonis, the uh, really great friend and the Arabic poet who uh, had been this wizard of the colleague, uh, perhaps in the same studio where I was. Uh, so it's, uh, it's uh, uh, all linked, you know, um, together. Okay, here is the poem. Brian and I will, will read part by part in Chinese and English. So uh, it's easier for the friend. Yeah, okay, here you are. 超前研究一爬山虎的红叶失血舔着血意舔他你的舌头存在吗我们的舌头存在吗死去的母亲怀抱这扇小窗沿着湖岸走
，才能忍住一枚红叶，摇曳沙鲁的美。Advanced study for Adonis. One, a moment of licking. Ivy's red leaves hemorrhage, licking the smell of imminent snow. Lick it. Does your tongue exist? Do our tongues exist? Dead mothers embrace this little window, still in hiding after death. A place addicted to betrayal, smeared with massacre. Beneath the vine's claws, does barbed wire torn flesh exist? Walking by the lake, death has a sweet and happy taste. Walking by deep autumn, iron railings tightly girdle lamplit words. Scattered words smash rifle butts in mothers' faces. In a landscape of ash, the gaze still fixes on a railway line coasting. It is cast into 1933, 1989, 2001. How uncaring must you be to bear a single red leaf, brandishing the beauty of butchery? Ar, transing, tong. 与玻璃之书，铜的词典衍生出书法。你选择，大英博物馆张开虚空，无视我们相依走过。一只玉臂鞋回头，无视海浪的古栏，精雕细刻，璀璨如大马士革，晦暗。如大马士革，一整六千年的底片含着树木，女诗人的葱绿间，那美少年含着化学，躺进成排灰色的孩子，一只只玻璃柜子无声震碎，被某一天，每一天，提炼出不呼吸的性质。玉臂鞋耸起双耳，聆听地平线那缕血丝。七五逢，打好，查理检查站，耶路撒冷，烛火失而年，每个母亲都会流泪。母亲们静静清点反光里的人影，望。无形爆炸，恒温计调控的立方中，母亲不会再变白的头发，恐怖的变黑，趁着拉玛拉街角上，一盏瞎透的灯，日夜照射，相依而行的鬼魅，辉煌如双行诗，你刚拈回的玫瑰，一股地狱味东西一夜夜冷凝的疼，我们向下迎娶继续大出血的新月。To walk through books of bronze and glass, calligraphy born from a lexicon of bronze, your choice. The British Museum opens a void, ignores us as we walk by arm in arm. A piece of jade wards off repentance, ignores the cobalt blue of the ocean waves, carved with a sculptor's precision, dazzling as Damascus. Dark as Damascus. A six-thousand-year photographic plate contains trees, among the loaded green of a poetess, that that Adonis contains chemistry, lies down 
into a row of grey children, glass cases silently shaken to pieces by a certain day. Every day extracts unbreathingness. Jade wards off both high-rise ears, intent on hearing the blood-streaked skyline leaching out of cracks in Dachau, Checkpoint Charlie, Jerusalem, candle flame wet and sticky, every mother will shed tears. In silence, mothers tick off reflected shadows, forget imperceptible explosions. In the thermostat control cube, mother's hair that will never turn white again goes terrifyingly black, sets off a stone blind lamppost on a Ramallah street corner, shining day and night on monsters walking arm in arm, glorious as a ghazal, the rose you just pinched back, a whiff of a stench of hell, washing page after page of congealed pain, downward we marry the hemorrhaging moon. Shu 不停越下的磁不停找到漏下的屋檐勾住的毁灭是否远远不够沉溺之诗里我们的美学 Three, poetic inquiry, another embedded voice. Can't be real. Is that beauty's fault? Imagine a shirt spread out on the riverbed, steeping in the black of a Berlin night. Imagine Two eyes, water choked, mother choking on water. Who says death isn't drenched harmony? A little window on the riverbed lights up the show. Riverbed, a word that never stops leaping downwards, never stops finding leaking, leaked out sobs. Leaves go down and wounds go up, houses down. Enjoyment of imminent snow goes up. Tongue tip. Is hooked ruin not enough by far? Imagine a self plunging down, drowning in history's black water, plunging like a pebble. There's no time other than the contraction of the lungs. 
There's no grammar other than a shirt that strips life away. Say, death's immeasurable side on human shape is filling up with sediment again, still not enough. In self-indulgent poetry, there are only newly arrived words. Touch, in here, he does all he can to pursue his own riverbed, to become it. Mother's vaporizing white travels in the opposite direction to beauty, spreads the worst of news. No one saw this poem coming so quickly, shattering, dazzling as our aesthetic. Tian 一串鲜嫩腐烂的念珠和这里那里喷绘一座城市沿着说了又说的凛冽诗洒落的比世界更多又一个水寒周年的星期天studies. 2001 BC, September 11th. 
that snow still unfallen, ivy withered into barbed wire, still encircling a distant view of the great eye of 1933, space either side of the stone walls filled with ruins. Sky's edge tears a breach open as each tower burns you collapse twice, then distinctly hear the heart of an East German soldier tightening his belt. No Tiananmen in my hand. A poem's anniversary. The throng is a dark cast iron cloud, brewing a crystallized reality. Snow, invisible underground, a string of fresh, rotten rosary beads, counting your hand counted jades to ward off the white inside you. Our hands stretched out, never far from butchery. Another square, heaped with dirty, shriveled children. Soaks the street corner oak, little locust tree, olive tree roots, with staring here and there at the bronze medal of the cold moon. With iron gates, a Berlin wall made of water can't pry open, one teardrop expels the unrecognising eye socket. A poem on fire jumps down, start to finish, never plummets into screams. On Potsdamer Platz, youthful dusk with chemical smelling liquids spray paints a city, covers a city, always this one. Second person of the BC of black sand cr crunching underfoot. Walking along unscrapable tongue fur, the solids of time scrape into your solidity. Along the skyline, letters created every second. Murdered mothers make us reiterate murder, stated and restated along bone-chilling cold. Poetry can't but be there. Playground laughter wiped sparkling clean. Mandelstam exposed each snow as the first snow. A poem destroyed is indestructibly alive. A tiny hexagon can't go past its tongue snags on the world, it's dribbling more than the world. A little window props one side of us up as we walk leaning together, choosing not to shoot as you pull the trigger, like an East German soldier picking a word in a poem, scribbling into an elegy that transcends every death that has ever been, B.C at both ends of a verse, suffering, utterly red, pinching. One more suck holds the Sunday anniversary. A silvery white recording stings the all-pervading heart, spasms once and has one history. A poem waits until the dead come lifelike back. Thank you. Now oh, finally finished. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Oh, that was astonishing and amazing how, I mean, Leanne, I, I thought I knew your body of work so well, quite well. And um, suddenly this whole of European history coming in as well as Tiananmen and 9-11. I, I mean, obviously working at the Wissenschaft colleague has, has really, has really, I mean, you've always created dialogue, but now there's dialogue, this cultural dialogue inside your poems as well. So, it's so strong and moving, but it's so interesting also. Well, to me, uh, well, because I, I like so much our, there's a theme, the poetry and the philosophy. Mm. Uh, 
but to me the philosophy never be only of metaphysical game you know just uh just uh, uh talking some blah 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 but i think the philosophy is a deep layer inside of the reality of our life and uh, and not only one part of life actually the life everywhere uh, so this uh, this in this poem i think yeah, just like a magda's wonderful poem it was a dialogue between you and me and actually inside of me or actually inside of you and uh, i think that's the, it's again in the broader um kind of a context, you know, uh, me, Adonis, uh, 9-11, Tiananmen, and uh, uh, well, actually the third part, there were the uh, part link with porcelain uh, inside of the poem. So actually you could say the whole history somehow uh, had been brought into the poem, not only into the poem, but into the deeper layer of our situation. And I don't really think uh, uh, that was only talking uh, one by one events, but actually all from a different the gates or doors, we get into this deeper layer of the situation. And uh, in this layer, like what Adonis, actually this BC, the idea of uh, 9-11, 2001 BC, there was the idea from Adonis and he wrote a poem uh, which read together with me. And uh, the title was the, uh, the Concerto of 9-11, 2001 BC. I liked it so much and I immediately opened up this, uh, this uh, uh, our rather narrower man of 9-11, but up to 4,000, wow. Uh, so in this case, you know, uh, yeah, yeah, the time has been deepened into this uh, this uh, uh, layer. I would like to call it poetry, the layer of poetry. Uh, this is what the, the, the poetry, I think, um, deal with. Uh, we are not only play uh, the, the, the metaphysical game, we don't only play the surrealist uh, uh, game in the language, we are discovered the deep reality within our this uh, language, breaking the normal uh, so-called logic, even the linear uh, idea of time, but dig it in. So it's, uh, yeah. That's really interesting. And Magda, did you want to respond to that? Because with Magda, I almost think that you move from the opposite direction. You move from the embodied self outwards. I think my um, my poetry uh, goes the other way around, more or less. I mean, it's like deepening uh, inside uh, myself and trying to find the the um, the, the deep inner state, which finally, as uh, Lian said, uh, coincides with the the cosmic uh, uh, outwards. Uh, what I uh, admire in Lian's uh, poetry is exactly this um, richness of layers of history and philosophy and uh, human uh, situation in the world, which uh, combine themselves and uh, give this uh, very rich uh, discourse. Also, I notice now the nostalgia, uh, this kind of melancholy, which uh, flows over his uh, his poetry, but uh, which is a consistent nostalgia. I, um, I wouldn't say um, constructive one, but uh, a good one, the one who nourishes the the real self of everybody in 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 the attempt to understand, but not only to understand to integrate history and time and uh, being in the world uh, in oneself. Mm, that's really interesting. You're both talking about integration in opposite directions. And I noticed that Brian smiled with recognition when you talked about this benign, this nourishing nostalgia. Magda, and I'm going to uh, ask Brian whether you want to say anything, but I also wanted to note that, of course, Magda and Leanne, you are both members of revolutionary generations. So for you, it's really inhabited experience, you know, immediately nationally as well as internationally. 
Brian, did you want to say something? Oh, well. A lot, I'm sure. And thank you so much for these consummate yeah. translations, which were just so extraordinary. I mean, one could just follow with absolute lucidity. I mean, the complexity, the subtlety. I mean, you might have been completely, obviously, I know no Mandarin, you might have been writing a completely different poem, but if so, they're masterpieces. You know, I, so. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. I just make it up as I go along, of course. You know. Yeah. Unfortunately, Yang Lien now understands English, so I don't get away with that like I used to. Um, when, we, when I first started working with Yang's poetry, I used to tell audiences, look, I just translate what he says. What he means is his problem. You know, it took me a long time to live with this poetry and find the place in myself where I could speak it. Mm. I think that's... You, you see, know, that's a sign of a radical poet in general. I mean, I think about the way in, in music that um, composers like Harrison Birtwistle will now get the performances, and Schoenberg even, now get the performances they deserve because musicians have now understood the pull of lyricism, even in 12 tone row and so yeah. on. Yeah, yeah, yes. I mean, my, my experience, my musical experience is from the other end. I really came out of early music, but it's very similar in a way. It's a way of, of finding a new voice uh, to make this dead page sing. And um, it's very, I mean, Chinese grammar is pretty straightforward. You know, man bite dog, dog bite man no conjugation, no declension, no fancy stuff. It doesn't mean it's easy to translate. No. Um, and it that's is... Because <laughs> you have to find the relationships between these things. Well, that's often the problem, yes. I mean, particularly in classical poetry, you, you just don't know who's doing what to whom, you know. But even in, in, in Yang's poetry, you, uh, pronoun subject, pronoun objects con continually left out. And I'm often having to write to him and say, well, who's doing what here, you know? Oh, he almost does diagrams for me, but I, I wouldn't want to put too much scaffolding in to make it too obvious. Hmm. Yeah, do you want to say anything in defence? I, I, I have to say that, you know, my almost all my dear translators hate me so much. <laughs> <laughs> enjoy, I mean, simply enjoy this. Uh, because like what we, uh, I think you are so right to ask uh, Magda read uh, her poems in Romanian because, uh, well, we do not need to share things on the just the shallow surface. We need to share the deep roots of uh, like a different uh, from different language, different countries, but because of the, that meeting, actually the good exchange had been uh, made. So, let, for let, example, let me tell a story here. The first time Yang came, the first time Yang and I met was at South Bank Centre for the Poetry International, where he'd been in Australia and I'd been in, in, in Britain. And we met for the first time and we took a, a tour, we took a journey. And we drove up to see my twin brother, who was a poet. Harvey only wrote in Scots, he didn't write in English. Yang's English was then, I would say, fairly creative, would that be a fair way of putting it? Uh, and the two had never met, Harvey spoke no Chinese. And by the second bottle, the two poets were head to head. The rest of the table was sitting around going, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the two poets' wives were going, yeah, married to a poet, talk to, you know, tell me about it. And Harvey and Yang were talking about metrics and about assonance and about uh, alliteration, you know, poet, poet stuff, although they hardly had language in common. Mm. That was a beautiful oh. moment that, wasn't yeah. it? And in fact, maybe that brings us on to Martin. And Martin, before you read, did you want to sort of say anything about situation, situatedness, because I, I know that you liked that idea very much. Well, yeah, I, I, I just put it out in the chat because uh, uh, Yang used that term or even, yeah, I proposed that it might be a concept because you repeated it as uh, uh, this situation that we're in. Uh, and I thought that I, I just liked it even th though I'm not sure what it means exactly, right? Instead of say, uh, history or life, uh, talking of poetry, uh, talking of poetry or a poem as a situation uh, that weaves together layers of history, quotes, uh, you know, uh, all, all the place names, of course, and, and what, what is a place, by the way, right? A place is a layer of situations and history and memories and dreams and everything. And in the same way, I think a poem might be that. I hope it's not getting too fluffy here. I just like the term of situation also because it's not so... Um, uh, what would you say? I mean, like if, if you say history, it has certain connotations, right? Uh, situation seems to be a more open field or space. I liked it. So it was, I was just commenting on, on, on a term uh, Yang used. 
Mm. Uh, and then I would, of course, take the opportunity to say uh, thank you very much to both uh, Yang and Magda. I really, uh, I really love these readings. They're amazing, aren't they? Well, I think we're going to love your reading too, Martin. Um, shall yeah, I introduce you? Leanne, I had a question. It's not a question so much. We've been talking about various things about philosophy and not the surface level philosophy, but one of the things that unite all your poetry in translations, at least visually for me, is the way the English is structured on the page. Um, um, because that's the access we have. I mean, I have another kind of access to your poetry because uh, the musicality of Chinese poetry is closer to my tradition of poetry than it is to Western English poetry. So that's another discussion which I won't go into because it's a complicated one. But what I want to bring in is because Brian's, uh, Brian, your translations are astounding. I mean, they're just terrific, absolutely superb, I think. Yes. You know, and thanks to you, I understand Leanne's poetry in a sense. I mean, you know, uh, but talk, going back to the way your poems are um, uh, presented on the page, you A, it, it's always, um, lowercase, there's no punctuation. The way you would use punctuation is visual um, chasms between phrases. Mm -hmm. Also the way you interestingly use indentations uh, also provides for the same kind of pause and breath pause. While you were reading the Chinese and while Brian was reading the English, I had marked them out. And it's interesting where you both pause. And it's interesting also where DDR became, you updated DDR to East German to just make sure that people understand it. So that's kind of a, but I want to uh, get back to Martin. the iceberg, iceberg type construction you have with your poetry. You know, it's all add something. And they all dovetail. And ultimately, by the time you ingest the poem, they all dovetail beautifully together. Can I leap in at some point? Yes, welcome, Janet. But at the Q&A at the end, please, because we are running ever so late. And um, we do really, actually, okay. I think, guys need to move on to Martin, or we might I use agree. the audience before really? Martin, the wonderful chance of, to hear Martin read. I'd love to hear Martin. Um, so shall I introduce yes. Martin? So um, Martin. Well, perhaps Leanne, perhaps Leanne can move on. Uh, could I just take the chance to say, because I said uh, thank you very much to Magda and to Yang for the readings, but I didn't say anything to Brian. I really loved uh, your uh, interpretation to your readings, especially the one with the riverbed. I thought it was very compelling, very, you know, I mean, like, I, I, I don't understand Mandarin, uh, but, uh, but I, I do think that that poem in particular, both your readings was, I mean, like, it, it was the Mandarin first, and it was very, like, seductive to me. And then actually it was the same in, in, in the English reading and, uh, or Scottish, the whiskey reading. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Brian, as well. Um, it's just that I don't forget. It's a bit early in the day for whiskey, though. <laughs> Thank you, Martin. Very well said. It's, it's absolutely true, isn't it? I mean, Brian's readings as well as his translations are wonderful. So, Martin, I'm going to force the spotlight onto you now. And um, it's a great pleasure to introduce Martin, who's also, I think, one of the most, um, now I don't want to say intellectual, because that's often used in a reductive way, the most intelligent of poets, the most thinking of poets. Martin Glasserup was born in Copenhagen in 1978, where he's currently living with his children. He has published many chapbooks, children's books, and a book-length theoretical essay on poetry and relational aesthetics. And Reading Places, a more personal piece of creative nonfiction dealing with place, memory, reading. And he makes an odd autobiography of the writer as reader. He's also published nine volumes of poetry, of which several are translated and published in Germany, Sweden, Finland, the US, Mexico and Greece. In 2015, he received his PhD from the University of Copenhagen for his dissertation on cultural memory and conceptual witness literature. Serup has been the editor of several Danish and Nordic literary magazines and is blogging at the really old school blog, kornkammer.dk. Currently, he teaches poetics and creative writing at the University of Copenhagen. And Martin has very kindly said he's going to start his reading with something in Danish. And I'm really looking forward to this and also to the way in which Martin's reading is going to speak to everything that we've heard so far. So welcome, Martin, and thank you very much. Thank you very much and thank you for having me and uh, again it's uh, 
it's truly a, a pleasure to actually be able to meet. I mean, like we are, people seem to be from all over the place right now online, right? Now that we can't go out, at least we can't in Denmark. Um, but to come back to the, uh, to the reading, I'll read from uh, different books, uh, four or five poems. Uh, and the first one, which is called uh, the English translation, the title of it is a poem uh, about happiness. I will read that in Danish to begin with, so you will get um, the sound of it, the melody, the music, uh, and then the, read, uh, the translations afterwards. And most of the translations are, are done by Christopher Sand Iwerson, I must uh, remember to say. Digt om lykken. Hvordan skulle et digt om lykken se ud? Vil ikke sådan her? Spørgende. Skal man være dyb? lykkelig for at kunne skrive et digt om lykken, eller skal man netop ikke være det? Skal man blive lykkelig af at læse det? Jeg tror, at lykken har med det konkrete at gøre, med objekter og steder. Lykken findes i et særligt afmålt tidsrum. Der findes en blå skål af lak, som jeg ejer, som jeg tænker på, når jeg tænker på lykken. Der findes et stykke klinket keramik fra Italien, der også får mig til at tænke på, Elsa, men vi var vist aldrig lykkelige. Jeg tænker ikke på mennesker, når jeg tænker på lykken. Jeg tænker på alkohol. Følelsen af lykken er følelsen af snaps, koskenkort og hvad vodt kan måske grappa, der glider gennem mig, der spreder sig en sol i kroppen og strålerne når hjerne og pik på samme tid susende. Som vinden suser om Ørerne på løberen, der løber bevidstløs, lykkelig og alene på vejen. And uh, I will read the same in, uh, in English translation. Poem about happiness. What should a poem about happiness look like? Presumably not like this questioning. Do you have to be happy in order to write a poem about happiness or should you precisely not be happy? Should you be made happy by reading it? I think happiness has to do with the concrete, with objects and places. Happiness is to be found in a, spe in a specially apportioned space of time. There's a blue lacquerware ball which I own, which I think about when I think about happiness. There's a piece of mended ceramics from Italy, which also makes me think of Elsa, but I don't think we were ever happy. I don't think about people when I think about happiness. I think about alcohol. The feeling of happiness is the feeling of schnapps, Koskun Korva vodka, maybe grappa sliding through me. A sun spreads through the body and the rays reach brain and cock at the same time rushing. Like the wind rushes around the ears of the runner who runs senselessly happy and alone on the road. Yes. Um, and uh, then I continue to, to read some other poems, uh, just in English, uh, since I suppose most of you understand that language better than Danish. <laughs> This morning was so eerie. The car's windows were white with frost. The frost wouldn't go away. I drove all the same as in a bad dream with my head out of the window. The others beeped, the others signaled. Here, here's another experience in a car, the ice. Not being able to stop sliding onward, going through a red light with a break to the floor. Another experience, the snow. And the sprinkler that doesn't work, the windscreen, a gray brown mass, opaque on the motorway, and the children in the back. Yet another. The car door opens. It happens several times the car doors on the motorway, the motorways, the children. The traffic is unreal. Often I've been about to be killed or to kill in it, and it hasn't happened to do after all. I'm on the third floor in the big red house looking out. It's late, the children are asleep, outside it's getting dark. When you're least expecting it, 
Charles Resnikov says at a reading in San Francisco in 1974, the light goes out. And when you're least expecting it again, he says, the light goes on again. <clears throat> yes. And then I read the, uh, the title poem of, of my most recent book uh, in Danish called uh, Uendelig Sommer, which is, uh, translates into Endless Summer. Endless Summer, unusual impressions, like staring straight at the sun. Strange subtropical smells in the coniferous forest. Strange subtropical smells in the deciduous forest. Strange subtropical smells in the towns, on the beaches. The blackberries oughtn't be out, already black and overripe. Gray yellow lawns, plants, dried out root systems, many meters under the ground. The jogger says, you just have to get used to the weather, drink water. The guest in the cafe says, you could talk about the weather before, you can't now. Unusual smells from the lakes too, from the sea, the oceans, luminous and beautiful, blue grain gruel. When a breeze blows, it's as though the algae think, what do they think about? The ducks have green beaks. The ducks have green lakes. People have stopped swimming in the lakes. People have stopped sleeping in their beds. They stand on their balconies at night in their underpants and stare at the moon. From the open windows, they gape across the fields in the morning, across the dust and fire and the smoke, which like the insects increase and increase tropical climate. The fire and the apathy increase tropical climate. Apathy itself, a lame little word, resigned and weak, increases. The apathy increases as though it had a girth we could grasp, as though it had a body which could grow interminably, it increases. And, uh, and the last shorter poem, and then after, after that, I'll, I'll read a, a longer and much different poem, I think, uh, and then let you off the hook. <laughs> um, this one is called The Bird and the Heart. In the lonely hours of the spirit, so Tarkle writes, I find the poem, and after that I find the recipe for shakalala, so I can make it when I get home. I don't know what turmeric is, but I need five milliliters. The sounds, a plastic bucket is put on the ground or the floor. It does something to me. I flinch, I'm alert, or maybe just paying attention. I imagine my meeting with a rain spider and regret my image search. Cleaning lady is an oddly antiquated word, like the word antiquated. She's more like a young girl, but not a maid. She also cleans other places. Her name is Precious. The sound of the electrical fence, a calm, a calm rhythm, the African theme. Recall the poems of Hans Lucht, but can't remember anything except that the heart can't make do with leftovers only outside a bird screams. I have learned it's a go away bird. I don't know if that's what it screams or if it is the bird that should go away. Yes. Um, and then I read the last, which is, uh, uh, it's it's a longer uh, it's a longer poem. It's called "Some Questions Concerning Questions," uh, and actually, it also has like a visual side to it, which for me is uh, difficult to you know share a, a screen or a slide with you now. So I, I'll just do it with my fingers, and or, and you have to use your imagination, right? Um, so that, that it's it's like a multiple choice poem. Some you know, so it's like yes, no. I'll do like that, and uh, then there's some suggestions for new punctuation, and I try to draw it with my fingers, right? Okay. Some questions concerning questions. 
Gertrude Stein says that the question mark might be good for branding cattle. In other words, it looks like a trademark. Maisa Aymobut says that the question mark looks like a big ear awaiting an answer. What does a question mark sound like? Rising intonation? See, Irene already asked you to answer this question carefully. Yes, no. Well, did you? Is a rhetorical question really a question? Yes, no. A rhetorical question is not really a question? Is it or it is? Who were you rhetorical question before you became rhetorical? A rhetorical question is a somewhat bossy, semi-violent one. It can't help it, it might be in its nature. A question mark doesn't really change that, does it? Does the qualities of rhetorical question stem mostly from its intrinsic nature or mostly from the social and discursive context in which it is being deployed? Do the rhetorical questions falling into nation sound different from real questions rising into nation? What is a real question? That's a real question, but is it merely a rhetorical one? Listen to me. Are you listening to me? How do you know if the question mark is really listening, if it, like a big ear, truly awaits an answer? How do you know if the question mark just sits there like a trademark, if it's really deaf or just showing off? What does a rhetorical question mark looks like? Do you look differently at the question marks in real questions? than you do in the rhetorical ones? Do you see either or is it more that you sort of sense them? This is a real question. This is a rhetorical question. Look, what's the question? At me? Are you looking at me? That's the question. You must be looking at me. I can't see anybody in here. Anybody else in here? Can you easily recognize and differentiate between the tone of a rhetorical question and the tone of a real one? Would your life be more easy if you could? Or more difficult? Ought the little words that often are complicit in organizing rhetorical questions to be marked clearly somehow, maybe in a bright color or a high pitch? Maybe you would answer this carefully, yes. No, maybe this question mark looks different than this. Is the question mark always the same question mark, notwithstanding the nature of the question, rhetorical or real? Did I already ask that? Who am I? What am I doing here? That's usually the question, that little je ne sais quoi, but does anyone really care? I think in particular about the question marks in the questionnaires of Max Frisch, Sierrene, and Maya Di Langberg, and about the question marks in the works of Ulf Karlof Nilsson and Maisa Aimo Boot that deals with questions, and about the question marks in Michael Ork Ma Michael Augustine's questions about poetry and Ron Silliman's red and black questions in Sunset Debris, and Christian Lyd Frostholm's frequently asked questions. But what is it that I think about them? Did Gertrude Stein ever write a poem solely consisting of questions? If yes, is it one of her better poems and was it published in 1917 or later? How does the question mark differ from other kinds of punctuation except that it might be better than some of the others, the full stop, for instance, to brand cattle and to use as a trademark? Which question mark is the better one to use as a trademark, the rhetorical one or the real one? If the question mark was to look more like a big ear awaiting an answer, shouldn't the dot be here instead of here? Unless, of course, if it's a big ear with an earring awaiting an answer, then it should be like this. 
But what would that mean in a rhetorical sense? Thank you. Bravo, bravo. Wonderful. Absolutely great. And so, my God, forcing us to make the thought experiments. Thank you so much, Monica. <laughs> Such a wonderfully, yeah, challenging and precise poem. It's so amazing to hear a poem about questions after one of the things that I was thinking about, um, to some extent, um, Leanne, but certainly Magda, how much Magda uses questioning as a way to mark out exploring. So what about you, Martin? Are you using, huh, if I don't sound like a an appendix to your poem. Are you using questions? Yeah. <laughs> it's like it's like all of a sudden you hear all the questions, right? It's it's impossible to make a you know a dialogue a conversation uh, featuring uh, questions and answers after listening to all these question marks. Yes, it, it is. Yes, it is. And did you did you are you kind of slightly challenging? Let me shut my phone. Up, are you slightly challenging yourself as well? I mean, are you do you think you're guilty of questions? Not just in the last poem, but. Uh, actually, I never, I never asked myself that question. <laughs> because uh, all your poems, I think, uh, of all your poems are thought experiments, hmm. which implies a sort of almost daring the listener, the reader, to go with you. Yeah, I, um, I think, you know, I, I, I think also, I, I don't know if, if in these poems in particular that I actually brought in. Well, actually, yeah, uh, that I that I uh, uh, name drop a lot, right? Uh, a lot of names on, on poets and places and people and politicians and what, uh, but it's also, I think very much, um, I, I know that this is not what you asked, but I take like a long, <laughs> long way around to come home, uh, yeah. you know, a short way directly. Um, um, I think like the name dropping is very much, um, holds a lot of um, um, a poetic quality to me. I think like every name, if if you don't know it, it's just a sound. If you know it, it, it holds a lot of uh, references like the word rose or dove or whatever. Um, and so it, it's it's because you, you call it uh, thought experiments, right? And we talked about with Yang's poem uh, or poems before, we talked about uh, all the different kinds of layers, uh, all the different kinds of say references or situations that occur. And um, and I think all all the uh, if if you call my poems um, uh, thought experiments they they always or at least uh, so I strive uh, holds on to like a a, a concrete uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. reality a, a sensed yeah. experienced uh, reality at least uh, I, I hope that that layer is apparent also in them of course maybe uh, less so in the last one I read right yeah. Uh, yeah. But I mean, particularly like the urgent, the urgency on the motorway. And so, no, very much you do it. So, you know, you make us think about the concrete by taking the concrete into the thought as well, I think, perhaps. Mm -hmm. But I think Leanne wants to say something too. Well, I'm so interested about this uh, uh, Latin, uh, Martin's last poem about this, uh, this, where so many question marks have been, uh, well, mentioned. And even the way of writing the question marks is very, very interesting because uh, I don't think you really know in the 2300 years ago, in the very first name of the whole Chinese poetry history, there was a man called Qu Yuan and he has this uh, a long poem, it's titled Tian Wen, let's say question to the heaven. And it's about 200 questions without answer. And the questions start from the beginning of the universe and something like a said beginning of universe. But who said that? And it was the first question, not like a Bible, but this directly addresses a question to said, you know, language, human being existence. But after all uh, those times when I study his poetry, but to think about our situation, I must say the forever, let's say the position of poet is to be a questioner. Mm. And uh, yeah, so it's, it's a philosophical, but very poetical too, because we are not only give one fixed uh, theories, but we opened up the questions. And uh, so your question on the questions is absolutely in the same tradition. And, and, and I feel that 
is crossing the time, crossing the space, different cultures, but after all, we meet in this point and uh, are all layers of reality, cultural language. And so, it, so is it, I'm, I'm so happy uh, our this reading was with this, your, this, this uh, uh, poem, which is simply echo of or answer or echo of this uh, ancient Chinese poet who is again our contemporary. Uh, so I think that's, I enjoy it. I enjoy this, this meeting. Thank you very much. Also, if we, you, should, you should write down the name for, for that poet in the chat or something so I could actually find it and read it. Uh, I, the first time I tried to write on this, uh, on this <laughs> screen, but uh, the, 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 yeah, I will write this. Uh, this is uh, the... But also in continuation to, to, to what you just said, uh, Lian Yang, uh, uh, the questions tend to be more interesting than answers, don't they? Oh, the, at least if they are not rhetorical, <laughs> it's much more energy, much more powerful. You know, this is why the the this uh, uh, about two hundred questions. Uh, well, it's not like a tr try to answer one question and then continue. It's actually the question deepen the questions. Yeah, like uh, I I said the first question like that, and second uh, question is like before the upper and the lower parts of the world separated. But how could you prove that? You know, that's <laughs> the second question. And, uh, and uh, because there's all mythology or some people say the said said, but who said that? How could you prove it? So the question start from that very, I say, profound level and continue, go through the mythology, history, reality, come back to the poets himself, but 2,300 years ago. And, uh, and <laughs> so, I mean, I mean, this building up a certain uh, way of thinking, I think we simply continue with that. But isn't I, it- I, I had the name it, of this poet uh, here. Isn't it linked again to this whole um, idea of the binary theory? It's on and off, exhale, inhale, a question, answer, and so on. So actually we are playing with the same cyclical cycles. These are things that will never go away. And in fact, uh, Martin, I was reading, uh, I don't think you read the poem, but uh, there's this fascinating poem you wrote uh, called The Field. And you start and you almost make the field a character and the character changes every time uh, the poem starts on a different page. And I'm gonna quote you actually, uh, in, in one of the poems of the field, because they're all field, 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 field. In one of them you say, the field does, doesn't like the sound of lawn mowers, but likes the smell of freshly mowed grass. And then further down, a few pages later, you say, the field isn't interested in pesticides. I mean, I think it's just marvelous juxtaposition of sort of Ian Yang, not his name, of course, but you know, <laughs> something up, but then you try and say, well, that's not true. But if it is not true, it is true because it is true. So I talk about that particular point because that, that, that's, a, that's a device you use um, in many of the other poems as well. Um, I, I, I do use sort of uh, repetition and also uh, distance maybe as, uh, as like a method or something. And the poem uh, you talk about, it's, it's the field and uh, I, I send, uh, 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 yeah, well, the rest of you can't see it, but I, I, I send some of my poems beforehand, before the reading, uh, so, uh, yeah, so the host could prepare, uh, but I just, I just reckoned we didn't have time for, for me going on, so I, I chose not to read it, but this, uh, uh, this book, The Field, which is also out in English, is, um, it is, yeah, very much, as, as you say, Sudip, uh, it's, it's about a field uh, that, that is in person, but it's, it has no age, it has no gender. Uh, it's probably from a Western country, middle-aged, well-off, uh, relatively well-off, not rich, but, you know, well-educated, have spare time, have a good job. And then, um, and then it's, it's like, I think of it, I tend to think of it very much as like everybody's autobiography. Uh, it's like, you know, the, it, it starts something like, uh, 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 yeah, well, uh, the field spends far too much time on Facebook. 
the field spends far too much time watching TV, et cetera. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's about 100 pages and then it expands. And also um, there would be sort of mini essays in there. Uh, at least that's, that's what I hope it is. <laughs> Uh, so, but, 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 but the field is like, you know, but also field, it's like an extremely, it's, it's a piece of extremely cultivated nature, right? Uh, and it's something that, it, that it happens to exist in most cultures, uh, fields, different sorts of fields, uh, but it's, it's, it's nature, but is it so, and in the same kind of, you know, man is a piece of, if, if we are a piece <laughs> of uh, extremely cultivated nature in the same way, I mean, like, uh, um, uh, are we nature? Are, are we? Are we culture? What? What is it? What's going on? Right. So. So of course it's also like a metaphor uh, uh, of society of man, and then I hope it's funny, uh, but also serious, right? You know, it's yeah. Another way to talk about experience as situation too, which is very pertinent. Magda, did you want to say anything? Did you want to come in at this point and maybe talk a little bit about well, well. Well. Uh... Yes, I, I thought of your uh, questioning, Fiona, about uh, the way I use the questioning mark uh, and so question mark. And um, I thought that, um, yes, uh, Leon is right and Martin is right. Uh, the question mark is a way of um, opening a situation, a, a polar or a, a binary situation to um, a response which is neither one or other, or we, which expands the, the the significance and our comprehension. The question mark is, is also a way of sus suspension, of suspending our our thinking, our normal and banal and circular thinking, the mm -hmm. everyday thinking which we have. And in uh, in the way Martin builds a series, a cascade of uh, question marks is a way of uh, getting out of this, uh, uh, you know, um, constructed and constrained uh, mentality that we have, and in a way of uh, of um, uh, getting through all this and uh, um, trying to find a, a real free thinking, uh, uh, a real free uh, feeling of reality, which is beyond wor words and beyond question marks. In, in my case, I use, uh, for example, these question marks as a way of uh, bridging two levels of reality, in fact. For example, the, you know, the uh, common uh, perceptible reality and the inner one, which is un invisible and disputable. And um, not all of us are convinced that this, this exists and that it's useful or maybe sometimes uh, they, they think it's dangerous and so on. So uh, uh, questioning, qu qu building a question is a way of uh, bridging uh, these different levels of understanding and the feeling uh, uh, of our beings and let them open to uh, several meanings and to many ways uh, manipulating them or using them so that uh, so that to uh, be able to build a more complete being. I think this is the role of poetry, to open up uh, to a more complete uh, being. Yes, can I leap in? Yes, Janet, I was just going to ask you, you had a question, so you must come in. Mm -hmm. Would you mind? It's a yeah, we're now open to the floor. <laughs> the floor. I'll be the floor. The um, seriously, Leanne, how are poets in China? And also, um, all of you who've taken part, this includes Brian and Martin, obviously, and Magda. How do you feel about translation? But first of all, how are poets in China? Oh, well, uh, I have to say that today, the poetry writing in China is uh, extremely exciting. Uh, unbelievable number of uh, uh, poets are writing and uh, amazingly huge number of new poems uh, come every second, every minute. And people said that uh, more than 100,000 new poems composed every day. And uh, it's shocking. And uh, But at the same time, it's uh, also a big, uh, let's say, question marks and uh, and uh, uh, people yes. are writing and writing but 
do they or do we really know what are we doing, you know, and uh, where is a poetry and why we write poetry and of course link how, but uh, I think that those deeper, uh, deeper questions are not always, um, you know, being asked or, or people think uh, in the awareness. Uh, so in this case, I think there are uh, the uh, contemporary Chinese poets, poets face to uh, many layers and many different sides of challenges. Uh, long and short, one the great tradition uh, from the uh, classical poetry is behind, uh, behind of us and international poetry is in front of us. And so the, uh, so we have to try to, um, well, maybe subconsciously, but bring all these challenges inside of each line of poem uh, or each form, uh, uh, each poem. Uh, well, to this back to what you said before, uh, for example, in the second part of the poems uh, we read today, advanced, advanced the study. Uh, the second part actually in the Chinese with a run, uh, each stanza has a special run and, uh, and uh, then in order to making this uh, creative uh, version of contemporary poetry, which is deeply linked to the classical Chinese poetry. And uh, this is different from a traditional form, uh, but it's form, it's a special design and uh, completed for this very poem. So in, uh, when, I, uh, uh, when Brian Houghton started to translate this one, this poem, I must uh, uh, pay my attention on not only uh, he was correct or not to uh, bring the so-called images or meanings into another language, but very much paid attention about the, his understanding and uh, the ability of recreate, recreation in the trans translations. And, uh, and uh, so uh, after long in short, uh, for me in the good case, I don't know this one is a perfectly good case or not, but in the good case, the good translation for me is like uh, the translator take the journey back to the root of the original poem. And then from that root growing another tree with, with the um, aesthetical demand, demands uh, set up in the original. So there's two different trees growing from the same root, uh, original experience, original idea of poetry. And that is my ideal way to, to see the translation. And dare I ask, no, oh. sorry, Janet. Um, can I just jump oh. in? I'm really sorry because this is not. Um, we want to honour all three poets. Leanne is a, and Martin and Magda have all three of us given us absolutely wonderful readings, and we have now run over because by a long way because they've been incredibly generous with their time, and we've tried to sort of balance it so that everyone gets part of the discussion. So maybe you would be able to contact Leanne directly afterwards and carry on with the discussion. But I'm going to hand over to Shadit now for closing comments. Shadit. I'm so sorry. Fantastic. This was really, really marvelous. What a, what a way to start the season. And uh, couldn't have picked better, better for some, really, really. And just such diverse, strong, muscular poetry. I mean, poetry that not just lifts all of us but makes us sort of you know delve deeper once uh, I mean I want to actually read much more of your poetry even though I know some of your poetry fairly well Martin is you're new to me but Leanne and uh, Magda you know it this is this it's also something that I it'll be lovely to sort of hear from you guys because we wanted this particular programming to be very different from straightforward reading. We wanted time, we wanted longer readings, we wanted discussion. Of course, there's not enough time for discussion because we have you know, three fabulous poets and each one demand a whole session, but we'll get to that. But really, thank you, thank you, thank you all. And um, you know, we will be up, all this will be up on, um, on YouTube and then we'll see each other next month, second Tuesday, and I'd like to bring 
uh, Don, who's been anchoring the technicals, who's a very, very fine poet himself. So Don, would you like to say something? Just a privilege to be here. It's just wonderful. Uh, much, much more than I expected and, and hoped for. Although I know these poets, I know they're wonderful, but the meeting itself, is, the event is just good. I'll keep the meeting open after we finish if you like to, if you would like to talk a little bit. I have to go off to work at some point. Um, so let me close this out and then, and then uh, stick around and talk some more if you like. Huge thanks to everybody. Just wonderful. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night and thank you very much. Okay. Is it just you and me? You want to see the piece of here? Hello, we. Ah, how many are here? Oh, could you please uh, put the.